Uh, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you. If you have a Bible, I invite you to open with me to Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. It's a great honor to be here in chapel. Thankful for the invitation uh, from my brother, Dr. Aiken. Uh, good to see so many familiar faces uh, this morning. If you visit Colossae today in southwest Turkey, you won't see much. <clears throat> it's just an unexcavated mound. And I have somewhat of a secret fantasy to excavate it one day, uh, though a friend of mine tells me that they've just started to, uh, to do some work there. Um, but the Lord has preserved for us uh, this letter to the Colossians, uh, which is a Christological masterpiece. Some of you uh, are old enough probably to remember the Ford Pinto. It wasn't a very impressive car. That was the Ford Mustang. And yet the Ford Pinto had a commercial that said, the closer you look, the better we look. And it turned out that the Ford Pinto had many problems. In fact, my, my dad had a Ford Pinto and it blew up the second time we drove it to Detroit. But that is true of Christ. The closer you look, the better he looks. And Colossians helps us to look at Christ, to turn our eyes on Jesus. And so let me read this text for us as we do just that this morning. Colossians 1 verse 15. He is the image of the invisible God the firstborn of all creation, for by him all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. In you who were once alienated and hostile in mind, doing evil deeds, he is now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. If indeed you continue in the faith, stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope of the gospel that you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation under heaven, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. And this is God's word. Let's pray together. Father, what we know not, please teach us. What we have not, please give us. And what we are not, please make us. For Christ's sake we pray. Amen. I don't know if you know anyone like this. You can just mention a particular thing or topic to them and it immediately triggers unending talk uh, about that particular thing. You might ask a friend who loves to travel, hey, you really enjoyed your trip to Paris, didn't you? And off they go, talking about all of the food they ate and all of the places that they visited. Or you ask a newly engaged lady, hey, tell me about your fiancé. And then immediately the, the pictures come out. And she begins to tell about this, this guy and where he went to school and, and how few times he was in jail and, and those kinds of things, right? <laughs> or you could start a debate about who's better, MJ or LeBron, which is really not a debate, but for some in, in their minds it is. And it, it, in, it br brings up endless discussion. Or you can talk about which city has the best barbecue. Or you can bring up Georgia football to Georgia fans. When I was in seminary, we had a professor that loved to uh, talk about Qumran. And whenever me and my friends would not have our homework ready for, for Hebrew class, I would raise my hand and I would say, Dr. Cole, didn't they find Psalm 42 in cave 11? And he would just go on and on and on about cave 11. And, and the class was just 50 minutes. And so none of us were in trouble for, for not having our homework finished. It's kind of like that with the apostle Paul. He turns on these, these gets on these runs throughout the New Testament, really long runs, usually often one sentence runs, and his subject is Jesus. And so it is here. You can see it in the text as he says, and he, and he, and he, and he. And what is it that triggers this, this run of praise? Well, it's what he was saying in verses 13 to 14, and that is this, this realm transfer that has happened for a Christian that we were once in the domain of darkness and now we have been transferred into the kingdom of God's beloved son. And just the mention of his son, just the mention of this transfer sends him on this praise. And that's what's happened to us today. We have been transferred out of the dominion of darkness into the kingdom of God's beloved son. That's the ultimate transfer portal that you want to enter into, to come into this now kingdom. And that leads Paul into this reflection, this, this, this praise, this hymn, of uh, about Christ and all of his glory. 
Now, contextually, this this passage is at the heart of Paul's overall thesis in the letter of Colossians, and that is that Christ is sufficient. And it's very important that we see the connection between the supremacy of Christ and the sufficiency of Christ. It's because Jesus is supreme that he is sufficient. The supremacy of Jesus assures you of the sufficiency of Jesus. And his sufficiency gives us hope today. If you're a struggling parent, a tired pastor, if you've been wounded by criticism or strained relationships, if you're in a spiritual valley, the supremacy of Christ is assuring us this morning that Christ is enough. Let's tell it to our our souls today. Let's tell it to one another and let's tell it to the world. The Christ who is supreme over all things is sufficient for all of our spiritual needs. Now, you may be aware of the situation in Colossae that called for this particular message. In chapter 2, verse 8, Paul calls this, uh, this false teaching that was present a philosophy that was not according to Christ. We refer to it as the Colossian heresy. And I'll spare you 2,000 years of debate uh, about this heresy, but in my judgment, uh, this was some kind of mixture between, uh, that had Jewish elements and pagan elements mixed together. Paul mentions various Jewish elements throughout the letter, like days, food, drink, shadows, substance. But he also mentions the worship of angels and visionary experiences and forms of asceticism. And so it was some form of Jewish syncretism, Jewish beliefs blended with, with Greek philosophy, syncretism. As I think about syncretism, I often think about the, the old school mixtapes we used to have when I was a younger lad. Some of you who grew up in the 80s may remember the mixtape. You would be listening to the radio and you would hit record when your favorite song would come on and you would make your own tape and you could have a mixture of everything from country to hip hop to reggae and we we called them bootleg tapes. And in Colossae, there was a bootleg religion that was being promoted. And Paul is saying, you don't need Jesus plus the, the mystery religion. You don't need Jesus plus the folk religion. It's just so present in a pluralistic culture. It's present around the world as you go to uh, places, as I've been several times into Africa, where you don't have to convince someone to be religious. What they don't don't have is theological clarity on who Jesus is. And so Paul here is writing to the Colossians, telling them that Jesus is enough. Just as you received him, chapter 2, 6 to 7, so keep walking in him. He wants them to be firm in the faith, as he says in a couple of places uh, in this letter. And as we this morning think about the sufficiency of Christ and his, his complete adequacy for us, I think we could look at our passage with, with, uh, with, with Jesus' CV in mind, if you like. Paul gives us a, a condensed catalogs, catalog of attributes of Christ, and I want to point out five of them. He speaks about Christ's clarity, then Christ's creation, then Christ's control, and then Christ's church, and finally Christ's cross. All of them display Jesus Christ's absolute supremacy. First, Christ's clarity. You see that in verse 15 when he says, He is the image of the invisible God. Now, you might think that in order to address address false teaching, you would first raise the problem and then give the solution. Not a wrong approach, but that's not what Paul does. He doesn't get to the heresy until chapter 2. He actually first starts with a proper Christology, which is instructive for us. Once the church has grasped the reality of Christ's person and work, they should have the discernment to detect false teaching and the courage to reject false teaching. And that's what a good Christology does. It helps us to detect false teaching and reject false teaching. A clear understanding of Jesus is the best protection against false gospels today. If you get Jesus wrong, you get everything wrong. It's kind of like the top button on your shirt. You get this one wrong and they're all wrong. You've got to get Jesus right. And so he begins by noting the incarnation, how the second person of the Godhead has revealed the nature of God to us. He is the image of the invisible God. Or as he says in verse 19, all the fullness of deity dwells in him. Jesus perfectly reveals, as Hebrews 1.3 says, uh, perfectly reveals the nature of God to us. You recall when Philip said, show us the Father and that'll be enough. And Jesus said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. He is the image of the invisible God, the perfect man, the perfect God. 
Or as we say in the Nicene Creed, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father by whom all things were made. Paul says that believers have experienced the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. Jesus brings clarity to this question, what is God like? And we don't believe in the God of our imagination, we believe in the God of revelation, perfectly revealed for us in Jesus Christ. Soon we'll be singing this Christmas carol, veiled in flesh the Godhead see, hail the incarnate deity, pleased as man with men to dwell, Jesus our Emmanuel. And this is why we have to get the gospel to the nations, because Jesus Christ is unique. This is what John Stott says. He says, why is it that some Christians cross land and sea, continents and cultures as missionaries? What on earth compels them? Is it, not, it is not in order to commend a civilization or an institution or an ideology, but rather a person, Jesus Christ, whom they believe to be unique. And yes, he is. Christ's clarity. Now, secondly, Christ's creation. What he says next would have baffled both the Jews and the pagans in Colossae. The Jews couldn't imagine Jesus as being divine, and the pagans believed that many gods were over the universe. But here we read that Paul says that Jesus is the firstborn over all creation. Firstborn does not mean that Jesus was created, in contrast to the many cults today. The whole passage is supporting the preexistence of Christ, isn't it? Next verse, Jesus created all things, therefore he was not created. There, were, there never was a time in which Jesus was not. He always was, wasn't. Always. This word firstborn, proto, uh, prototokos, has two primary meanings. It can mean the first in sequence, or it can mean supreme in rank. It's interesting, I think Paul uses both in this passage. But regarding this particular verse, he has the, the former in view, that Jesus is supreme in rank. He is the first born over all creation. It's, the, it's a similar usage to, uh, it, that we see in Psalm 89, verse 27, referring to David. I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings on earth. He wasn't first in time, but he was first in supremacy. And so it is with Christ. He is the firstborn over creation. He is Christ over creation. He outranks everything in creation. Microscopic and cosmic, physical and spiritual, biological and geological, global and local. And I hope there's still some aspects of creation that make you just stand in awe and lead you to praise Christ. What a wonderful time of year in this part of the country to marvel at Christ's beautiful creation. And we see here his supremacy is seen in these prepositions, by, through, and for. Paul praises Christ through prepositions. He says everything was created by him in that he was the origin or cause of creation. Everything was created through him in that he was the mediating agent through whom it actually came into being, not angels or other intermediaries as was being taught in Colossae. By him, through him, and created for him or toward him in the sense that he is the end or goal of all creation. All things are meant to serve his will for his glory. And his supremacy is seen in that little word, all, isn't it? It's like Paul is going to every nook and cranny of existence saying that all of it was created by him and through him and for him. And his his supremacy is expressed in his power over those visible and invisible powers, heaven and on earth, These invisible powers that are called thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, which in chapter 2 refer to evil forces. And Paul doesn't go into detail here about them, like why were they created in the first place or how did they fall. His point is simply that Christ is sovereign over all of them. And consequently, he's saying to the church, by implication, you don't need to fear these dark powers. That was a big deal in the first century. But once you have clarity on who Christ is, you can relax. We don't have a puny Christ. We have a preeminent Christ. There are evil forces at work in this world, but this is our Christ. And this is why we can go to the hard places. This is why we can do hard things and how we can endure hard things. This Christ is with us. This Christ is in us, and this Christ is for us. Christ's clarity, Christ's creation, verse 17, Christ's control. I love how the word chi is in the Greek in 17 and 18. 
and, and, it's like he's saying, there, and there's more. And there, there's always more to Christ. And so he says, and he is uh, before all things, and in him all things hold together. They all cohere. H.G. Mule put it well when he says, he keeps the cosmos from becoming chaos. Or as the writer of Hebrews says, he is the radiance of the glory of God, the exact imprint of his nature, and he upholds the universe by the word of his power. And again, this, this should give us a great level of peace this morning. In ancient paganism, people suffered from anxiety because they didn't know if their god or goddess was in control. Chaos could happen at any moment. And today, the secular espouse a view that, is somehow, that the world is somehow held together devoid of God. And Paul says, no, in him all things hold together. Jesus Christ sustains the cosmos moment by moment. And this doesn't mean there aren't hurricanes or earthquakes. There were earthquakes in Colossae. But why doesn't everything fall off into nothingness? Because in him all things hold together. And therefore life is not meaningless. And the world is not utter, complete chaos. This doesn't mean you won't experience pain or discouragement. You most certainly will. But what this does is give you hope that this is the Christ who is sustaining you today. This is the Christ that will sustain you until the last day. If Jesus Christ can sustain the cosmos, he can sustain us in our chaos, in our trials, in our despair. It's an old hymn that says, immortal rest on Jesus' head, my God, my portion, and my living bread. In him I live, upon him cast my care. He saves from death, destruction, and despair. Jesus saves us not only from death, praise God he does, but he also saves us from despair. The Christ who sustains the cosmos is sustaining us in our chaos. I don't know if you've ever thought at some point in your life and in, in ministry, you, I don't know how I haven't lost my mind completely by now. It's like the hymn we sing, when I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. He created it all. He sustains it all. He is enough. We should never look to Jesus and say, you're not enough. But you are enough. Early in our marriage, Kimberly and I were living in New Orleans, and we hadn't had many meals yet. And she made a spinach salad for dinner. And I, I don't mind the spinach salad. I'm just looking for what's coming after the, the spinach salad. And so I, I was in the kitchen, and I'm looking everywhere for the meat. I'm, I, there's nothing on the stove. There's nothing in the crock pot. Uh, there's nothing on the grill. And I'm and like, you, you, I, I can't live like this. Like, I, I, I have to have some protein, you know? Like, um, this is not enough is what I would say. And we should never look to Christ and say, you're not enough. And I've learned not to say that about my bride's meals either. Uh, she's just trying to bless me and to keep me healthy. We have a completely adequate Savior. Christ's clarity, Christ's creation, Christ's control, fourthly, Christ's church. Paul has a pivot here, I think, where he moves from Jesus being Lord over creation to Lord over redemption. And he begins by talking about how Jesus is the head of the body, the church. He is the head. He guides and governs his church. And the body points to at least three ideas. One, there is a mysterious, intimate union between Christ and his people. He's the head, we're the body. Second, that the church is a living organism made up of members joined together. And third, the church is the means by which Christ carries out his purposes on earth. That means the church is a big deal. It's a glorious thing to be part of Jesus' church. I love a story Alistair Begg tells that speaks about the significance of the church. In the 1920s, a guy named Lord Reith helped establish the BBC, the British Broadcasting Corporation. And then from 1927, he served as its first general director. And he apparently was a strong man from the highlands of Scotland. And when the BBC began to be carried along by the tide of secularism that swept through Britain in the 60s, a young producer stood up in a meeting and said to Lord Reith that, quote, the world was changing and that the BBC did not need to continue its religious programming output. He said people were no longer interested in it. And then he added that the church was becoming increasingly obsolete. Lord Reith, who stood six feet six tall, stood up 
told this man to take a seat, and he said, the church will stand at the grave of the BBC. And yes, it will. It will stand at the grave of every news outlet. It will stand at the grave of every institution. It is Jesus' church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. This is Jesus, the resurrected Lord's church. Now here, firstborn, I think, does mean first in sequence. And you can see that just by the, the, the fact that there's a word before it that says beginning, the arche. He is the beginning. He is the first one, the firstborn from the dead, the first to rise from the dead, never to die again. You could think about Jesus as a trailblazer or a pioneer, a pathfinder, similar to Neil Armstrong when he stepped on the moon and he said, one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. He was saying that there would be more to follow. And so it is with the resurrection. In Michael Green's book, The Empty Cross, he speaks of Jesus as a trailblazer, and he uses a really good analogy, I think. He says, in the Middle Ages, there was a debate about the possibility of a sea route to India, and there was much debate politically and economically about this. Was there a way to this rich land of spices and perfumes around the tip of Africa? Every attempt had failed to this point, so that the cape at the tip of Africa was called the Cape of Storms because there were so many wrecks. But eventually, one sailor succeeded. He rounded the Cape and reached the east, the Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama, the first European to reach India by sea. And ever since he sailed back, it has been impossible to doubt that there was a way to the Orient. And that Cape was renamed to the Cape of Good Hope. And Green says it's like that with Christ. He is the firstborn from the dead. He is the first in sequence. There is more to follow. He is the Christ of good hope. We ask, is there any way through death? Can you go into death and back uh, out into life? And the answer is yes, because Jesus has taken this voyage into the darkness and into death, and he's come out in resurrection glory so that he takes your hand and he takes my hand when that day comes, and he says, as I live, you also will live. You see, what is true of Christ is true of his people. What is true for the head is true of the body. And by the Spirit right now, we share in the risen life of Christ, and one day we will experience it fully. Verse 17, Christ can deal with your despair. He's controlling everything. Verse 18, Christ can deal with your death. He's conquered it. And verse 18 summarizes everything he said from 15 onward, that in everything he might be preeminent. Just as creation depends on him for its existence and order, redemption depends on him as he is the primary figure in our redemption. So let him have first place in our lives, in our churches, in our ministries. That is Christ's church. And finally, Christ's cross. He says in the next verse, for in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell Then he adds, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. So first there's a statement again about the deity of Christ, that all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. There are a lot of people apparently in Colossae that thought that Jesus was powerful but not divine. And Paul says, no, all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell in him. And I know in this room this morning, you're aware that church history is, is littered with debates about the nature of Jesus. We think about Athanasius, who argued, argued for homoousios, that Jesus was of the same essence with the Father, arguing against homoousios, that he was just of similar substance with the Father. Just one letter difference, but it makes a big difference. <laughs> it's kind of like a time uh, I was on a treadmill one day, and I had to do a, a wedding later, and Kimberly texted me, my wife, and she says, Shauna is bringing lunch. And I was thinking, that's great. I don't have to grab lunch. Finished my workout, went home, showered, put my suit on, go. And I'm looking for lunch. I was like, where's the lunch? She's like, what do you mean? I said, you said Shauna's bringing lunch. Where's the lunch? I, she said, Shauna's bringing punch. I said, you, you wrote lunch. I've got the text right here. Like, <laughs> there is a big difference in lunch and punch, uh, especially if you've just worked out. And there is a big difference in homo usios and homoi usios. Is Jesus of similar substance 
or of the same substance. And the reason that's important in this particular verse is that this means he's uniquely qualified to reconcile you to God because of who he is. There's no other person in that category except for Jesus. And this Christ, who is fully divine, went to the cross. And Paul is saying, even there, even in this descent down to the cross, we see his supremacy. We see his glory. He speaks first of of his cosmic reconciliation, that it is through him to reconcile all things to himself, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of the cross. Notice the scope of this. To reconcile all things, the whole created order. And Jesus is not just Lord over some spiritual never-never land, but he's the one who took on flesh and he will redeem all of it. This is similar to Romans 8, 20 to 23, isn't it? That the whole created world is, is groaning. It's out of sync. It's in futility. It needs to be restored, and one day it will be restored. I don't know why I have so many Christmas carols in my sermon notes, but here's another one that we'll sing pretty soon. He comes to make his blessings flow. Where? Far as the curse is found. And where is it found? Everywhere. And Paul, I'll say, even the cosmic work of Christ is through the blood of a cross. That's a remarkable thing to think about, isn't it? Listen to what David Garland, great commentator, said. The death of an obscure Jew on a seemingly God-forsaken hill in a backwater of the Roman Empire attracted no notice from the historians of the era, but it was the event that reconciles heaven and earth. The world may be corrupted, disordered, and ravaged by sin, but God still loves it, and God intends for it to fulfill its destiny in Christ. Sin has defaced Christ's work in creation, but he came to undo its consequences and bring uh, uh, concord in a universe out of harmony with God. So the cross here has this cosmic dimension. And then finally, in verses 21 to 23, you see this personal dimension of reconciliation. And you notice how Paul has been flowing in this text. He and he and he and he. And now he gets to verse 21 and he says, and you. This Christ thinks of you. This may have been the smallest town to have received a letter from the Apostle Paul, a very somewhat insignificant place. And he's saying, this Jesus, he also came for you. And he, and he, and he, and you, who were once alienated, hostile in mind, doing evil deeds. That was our past condition, our past alienation. They were alienated from God relationally. They were hostile toward God in regard to our thinking, and our lives are marked by evil deeds. It's not a very popular message today, but one that must be understood before someone can receive the good news, right? Our past alienation and then present reconciliation. Notice verse 22. He has now reconciled in his body of flesh by his death in order to present you holy and blameless and above reproach before him. Here he's speaking justification language, isn't he? That somehow we can be holy and blameless and above reproach before God. How? It's because of what Jesus has done for us on the cross. As one writer put it, Jesus was treated as if he were me so that I might be treated as if I were him. That great exchange that took place. So he moves from past alienation, 21, present reconciliation, 22, to future glorification, 23. If indeed you continue in the faith. Saving faith is a, is a persevering faith, isn't it? God is preserving us as we are continuing. Stable and steadfast, not shifting from the hope you have in the gospel. This is really Paul's burden in this letter. Colossians, you don't need Jesus plus something else. Don't shift from the hope of the gospel. Stay rooted there. That you heard, which has been proclaimed in all creation. Paul is saying, what you are hearing from me is consistent in what I'm preaching everywhere else, and of which I, Paul, became a minister. So he's saying, don't shift, don't waffle, don't go anywhere, just stick with Jesus. Don't dabble in the mystery religions or these folk religions, but keep your eyes on Jesus. I love the flow of this text. From the cosmic Christ's, into the lives of the Colossians, and then extended to the whole world. Isn't that beautiful? That this cosmic Christ 
who has brought clarity to who God is, who has created all things, who is in control of all things, who has risen from the dead, who has his church. He is now sending us out also to be servants of the gospel. We are good news people in a bad news world. And, and we have really been shaken up by recent headlines, haven't we, about what a world we live in and how this world needs this Christ. They need this Savior. And so, Paul, we don't, we're not going to go into the next paragraph, but I do love how this whole flow of Christology eventually kind of funnels down to verse 28 when Paul says, Him we proclaim. Him we proclaim. I love how the Phillips paraphrases verse 28. So naturally we proclaim him. In light of everything that's just been said, why would we want to proclaim anyone else? So naturally we proclaim this Christ. The closer you look, the better Jesus looks. And today we see him with the eyes of faith. And my, my friends, one day our faith will end in sight. And we will see him. And when we see him, we will not regret having kept Jesus central in our lives, in our churches, in our families, and in our ministries. Thanks be to God for his word. Let's give God praise. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for this majestic portrait of Christ that we see here in Colossians. May the supremacy of Jesus today give us security about the sufficiency of Jesus. Whatever my friends are going through in this present moment, that they would know that this Christ is enough. And I pray that as we go out of this place that we would um, regularly be commending Christ to others and that we could serve out of a Christ-adoring heart. And so we give you praise, Lord Jesus, for all that you are, for all that you have done, and all that you will do. And we pray this in Jesus' good name. Everyone said, Amen.